Monoblock. In this video I'm going to be taking apart this Multitracker X14 made by Fostex. I actually have already tested this and I, I know it works fine but imagining you have some sort of problem with yours, maybe there's belts gone, maybe it's crackling and popping and you need to clean it, maybe there's some soldering you need to do. Here's a little bit of reconnaissance to see how you take this to pieces. So these four fader caps come off from the front. I'm using these kind of plastic tools that you'd use for taking the upholstery of a car. This main output control, that comes out from the front as well. If you're struggling with that or you didn't have an appropriate tool then you could just wait until we've got the two halves of the case open and that would pop off. Here in the back, um, the two halves of the plastic case are held together by one, two, three, four, five screws. I've already removed four of them, so I've just got this middle one to take out. They're all like this, so maybe just shy of two centimetres long, wide ferrule, black in colour for use with a crosshead screwdriver. Then the uh, top part will come off, you need to tip it forward slightly just to get past these transport buttons. And at that point the unit is going to open up this away into two halves. Uh, you can see that this lower board which is the record and playback amplifiers and this upper board which is the mixer and input amplifiers are connected by two ribbon cables. I recommend that you don't open these. In my experience these are very difficult to put back once you've opened them. I've had to resort to crimping on new connectors and soldering in new headers onto the baseboard because I just can't get these to connect again properly. So let's focus on getting the transport out. This on the left is the erase head. Playback and record head is here on the right. You can see these grey cables coming from it terminate two connectors here. The cables going into those connectors are thin and fragile, so pry those up not put any stress on the wires themselves. The colour of the connector matches the header, as does the number of pins, so use that as a guide on reassembly. And then the erase head is connected by these brown cables to two headers here. And we can see there's a cable running to the motor and uh, to a couple other leaf switches and so on that are under there. They all terminate in one white header here. The wires are thicker than this so I can just pull that out. Then there's going to be one, two, three, four, five screws. I won't show you those locations again. Like I'm an air hostess. I've only got two of the screws still in. These ones have got common ground connectors so we're just basically making sure that all the points labelled earth on the diagram join up to the same place so you don't get a buzz in the system when you're using it. So there's one up here that's connecting to the lower of the two printed circuit boards and there's one here that's wired back to the play and record head. So when you reassemble just make sure that those two go between the mounting screw and this chassis plate on the transport. Unless I say otherwise, all the screws that we are removing from this point forward are of this type, maybe about a centimetre and a half long, brass in colour. At that point, the entire cassette transport will lift out. Now, although this unit plays at uh, the low speed of 1.78 inches per second, which is the slower speed on most dual speed quarter studios, it's the same speed as commercial cassette. The motor in here is actually EG 530KD2F Mabuchi, which is actually capable of 3200 RPM and it's got four wires on it. So that makes it a little bit more awkward if I was going to try and mod this for pitch control, which I might at some point. But it does actually mean that if we wanted to, we could get this to play back at three and three quarters inches per second. The, the motor is capable of that kind of speed. Other thing to notice about this transport is we've seen it before in other videos I've made. Like this is the same transport that's in a Tascam 44 Mark 1 and Mark 2 and the Porta 07 all of which are high speed. So in terms of belt sizes, I'm just going to refer you to my videos on those. There's no point in me repeating that process, but you can see briefly that there are three belts in total. All these belts, I can get the right sizes for these in a multi-pack of cassette square section belts that you can get from likes of eBay for a few pounds in my region. So a few euros, dollars, rupees, whatever in your region. Moving on, let's remove this printed circuit board. So I've only got two of the screws in at these locations, but I hope you can see that there are another three places where there would be screws. So I'll just take those last ones out and I'll do my air hostess bit again. 
Last thing we want to do before lifting this out is notice that there's a little connector here that's making an electrical connection from some shielding underneath there. The first time I saw one of these connectors in a Fostex I thought I'd broken it. I thought that had snapped off but it is actually a little connector that just slides over the pin coming out of the board. Actually a much more convenient solution than this uh, ring connector thing that you see all the time in Tascams. So with that out, just tip that forward from the front slightly and that comes away from the case so if you needed to desolder and replace any of these components it gives you access to that board. Notice by the way I'm doing all of this on a foam cushion so that nothing gets too scratched or battered. Then this um, upper input amplifier come mixer board, the locations of the screws that attach that are as follows. Here, 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 here. So that's five in total. Notice that these two holes are just pass-through holes for the two halves of the plastic case to join together. So I've only got one screw in at the moment, just in order to make this quick to film. Take that out. And then that's just gonna lift up like so. You can see we've got another bit of shielding. Again, it's this type of connector where this little plug slots over a pin there. We could take these knob caps off at this point, but actually it's not necessary in order to clean that. We've got pretty good access to the moving parts. If these were rustly or crackling, then what we'd want to do is spray a bit of contact cleaner and there, agitate it. Ideally blow it out with some compressed air, maybe repeat the process a couple of times depending on how dirty these were at the beginning with. If it wasn't too dirty and you had um, an expensive contact cleaner like this, which has a lubricant built into it, like this deoxid stuff, you wouldn't need a lubricant. If you're using a harsher, but in my region at least, less expensive contact cleaner like this Surface All Super 10, then it's going to strip the lubricant that was placed in these when they were built. So you're going to need to replace that. Um, I tend to use this Deoxit Fader Lube. It seems to work absolutely fine for switches and pots as well. You can see that these faders, the conductive surface is exposed, so they're nice and easy to clean compared to the kind where it's sort of like a little metal box with a slit. And then we've got a little contact switch here. You'd probably clean that. That's connected to this record select button here. And then you'd probably want to clean your main volume for your line out and your headphone socket there. Should you need to calibrate it, these blue and white components are the trim pots. They are sensibly labeled, so bias frequency, record, so that's record level, and rep, so that's reproduction level, your playback level. Um, I have plenty of videos about calibration on my channel. Check out the splash page for the channel. Last thing is the removal of the door. Uh, you may find that you have a broken door that you have to fix. So there's just one screw here. And it's holding in this leaf spring. That downward slant of the leaf spring wants to point downward. The spring would keep that open when it left it open. Push these in very slightly and pins on these hinges fit through little holes here. You can see in my case when I received this actually the door was broken in two halves. I glued it first with super glue just to keep the steady while I spin welded it. So this is the result of the spin welding and uh, the melted plastic is kind of fused with the original acrylic or whatever plastic this is. And then I filed it down so that that fits in the recess and that's now a very strong break. I go into that process in a lot more detail. I've got a whole section on my YouTube channel about spin welding if that's something you want to investigate further. You're almost certainly going to see this again. I'm going to be experimenting with adding a pitch control, maybe a wide range one so that I can get this all the way up to three and three quarter inches per second because like I say the motor's capable of it. What was the other thing? Yeah, retrobriting. Retrobriting is when you put peroxide on plastic and either expose it to UV light or just natural sunlight over a longer period. Um, I've got to say I kind of like this, the simplicity of it. I like the fact that it's got a built-in microphone and that the built-in microphone looks like Mickey Mouse but he's got a microphone face. It's great. From a certain angle, this little bit makes the cassette look like a cat's face. I fucking love cats. So yeah, this guy will be back. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again soon.